everyone. Welcome again, yet again, to another research overture, which is our talk series focusing on new research topics that we're developing here at FCL. Uh, we will be talking about extended urbanization in agricultural territories, operationalization, peripheralization, and enclosure. Uh, we have four speakers today from the new urban agendas under planetary urbanization module at FCL. We have the principal investigators of the module, Professor Christian Schmidt and Assistant Professor Naomi Hanakata. And we also have uh, researchers, Dr. Nitin Batla and Caroline Kotska speaking today. So this seminar is an opportunity for our team to articulate their aims, their aspirations, challenges, their apprehensions. Uh, and it's also an opportunity for you to help us shape the research through the dialogue today. Uh, so please keep your microphones muted through the duration of the talk, but feel free to post your questions in the chat as we go along. Uh, we'll have a longer extended discussion towards the end of the session of the presentation. Uh, but for now, I would like to hand over to the team to kick off this overture. Over to you, Christian, Nitin, Naomi, and Caroline. Okay, yes. So thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for the introduction. And um, hello, everybody. Um, we are very happy um, to uh, make uh, our presentation. For us, it's still morning, so I'm, I'm never I'm never very um, happy with the mornings uh, to to talk. I usually write in the morning. This is the best thing I can do. But anyway, I I try my best. So um, I start with my presentation. Um, so. Okay, um, yeah, extended urbanization in agricultural territories. Um, so, so that's the topic for today. And um, we will have um, actually um, four contributions. They were already announced. Um, so uh, after my talk, uh, there will be Nitin Butler, um, agrarian questions on planetary urbanization. There will be Naomi Hanakata, operationalization in Southeast Asia. And then at the end, Caroline Costa, Kostka, uh, agroecological design for the Zurich region. So you see there is a quite a big package that we present today. Um, so planetary urbanization, um, as my talk now, um, I mean, the first we have to somehow clarify what is what is actually planetary urbanization. Um, this is a concept that um, we developed um, well about a decade ago actually um, to try to grasp the let's say the current challenges of urbanization and if I say we then um, this is basically Neil Brenner and I who developed that concept. Um, there was also Andy Murrayfield who developed a similar concept in parallel. We know each other, so we had already discussions before. Um, and um, it's a concept that relies strongly on Henri Lefebvre's um, hypothesis of the complete urbanization of society. And it was basically um, the, let's say, observation that um, urbanization processes got a planetary reach. That means all over the planet, we see traces of urbanization. So that's the basic ideas about that. So, um, so, so, it's, so, so we, we will see quite some examples uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the coming, in, now in, in these presentations. Um, but we, we see all over the planet, we, we see certain traces, we see certain elements um, of urbanization. So, so, so the point is um, to make this distinction between urban and rural, um, the classic distinction is not really, um, let's say, promising anymore, is not really helping us understanding what's going on on the planet. And in order to understand that better, we need a planetary perspective. And that means that very simple um, to decentering the analytical perspective. So usually if we talk about urbanization, we position ourselves somewhere in the center um, 
and uh, let's say in the in the, so, somewhere somewhere in the center of Singapore, and then we look outwards. So so how big is Singapore? So what is the reach of that city? Uh, and and uh, or or, or, or we, we place ourselves in Zurich at um, at the Parade Platz, and then we look how big is Zurich? But that's that's not the point anymore. I think we should uh, we should place ourselves somewhere out out somewhere, and 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 then and then try to understand. So, what kind of urbanization processes are approaching here? Now, in order to do this analysis, um, we developed a kind of concept. Um, so, Neil Brenner and I um, about um, so, so three basic understandings or three basic processes of extended uh, of, of urbanization. So, concentrated, extended, and differential urbanization. And that. Um, so, here we have some definitions. Um, but I will just go into the, um, let's say, explanation of that. Um, so the classic understanding, if, if you look on, on urbanization processes, we look usually on the big cities, no? So here we have the 500 biggest cities. This was in 2008, but the picture is not so difficult, uh, not so different today. So we look um, um, on, on this urban world. And so we think, okay, so these are the big agglomerations. So each of those agglomerations has more than um, 1 million inhabitants. And so we think this, this is the important way um, uh, of urbanization. So, so, so that's, that's the kind of concept. That's the kind of places we have to, um, we have to try to understand and to problematize. And um, so here, in that case, we would look on agglomeration processes. Um, we would look on urban regions, we, we might even look on mega regions, and we could also say that there was a kind of urban triumphalism that developed in this kind of research. So to say you have to be in the big city and then uh, you have a future and if you're somewhere outside in the peripheries, okay, you somehow, um, you're, you're, a poor, you're a poor person who, who has not access to the, let's say the important, um, well, qualities and, 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 and opportunities that the big cities are offering. So we think this is not a very helpful perspective, actually. So we look, on the other hand, also on processes that, that, are, that are beyond uh, these, um, these, all these centers. And that's maybe a map that uh, is maybe more adequate to understand today's urbanization processes, a map of shipping lanes, global shipping lanes. And um, so, so here we can see, so these are the big uh, container boats that, that travel the oceans. And we could say this is even a kind of urbanization of the oceans. And we see these kind of heavy uh, shipping lines. Um, and, and we see here, for instance, what happens if one of these big ships just kind of uh, blocks the Suez Canal. Uh, or, or we see, uh, let's say here, um, the um, Singapore Strait as the most congested, uh, let's say, shipping lane of the world. Um, so, so here we have suddenly a different picture of urbanization processes. And that's what we call extended urbanization. So we can't have concentrated urbanization. Um, that, that means we can't have concentrations, big concentrations of, of, of people, of jobs, of, of all sorts of um, activities without extended urbanization, without producing food, without delivering water without producing raw materials somewhere on the planet and processing it and delivering it to these uh, concentrated places. And so we have also to look on how the planet is changing beyond the suburbs, beyond the agglomerations, beyond the urban regions. And then the third point is also um, differential urbanization, that means the qualities that we can see in urbanization processes. I can't go here into the details, but it's just important to mention that, so that ur the urbanization process is on the one hand a process, but it has also a potential. It has a potential, uh, it has the poten potential to somehow um, create centralities, to create differences, to create mediations, 
And um, so the real urban moment is where differences are coming together and are becoming productive. So different people meeting and becoming productive, developing new ideas. And classically, the, this is the, the idea is okay that that can be uh, that that can take place in Paris or in Singapore or in London or somewhere in these big metropolises. But um, we somehow have to find ways that these qualities of urbanization and of the urban also um, are taking place in much more remote places. Okay, so how do we analyze um, extended urbanization? Um, actually, we started with this kind of analysis already more than 20 years ago, when we started um, in Basel at the ETH Studio Basel with um, a project on Switzerland, um, together with um, famous architects, Roger Diener, Jacques Herzog, Pierre de Meuron, Marcel Miley, um, and I, we, we kind of had a project to analyze Switzerland and we analyzed Switzerland um, in a, um, already in a way so that we analyzed the entire territory, not only the big cities in Switzerland, which are not so big actually, but the entire territory and to trace urbanization processes all over the place, also in the mountain regions, also in the quite remote um, valleys um, there. Now, then we continued this kind of analysis um, in, 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 in a more worldwide scale, um, the inevitable specificity of cities. And there we also looked, for instance, on the Nile Valley. So you have the concentrated urbanization in the Nile Delta, in Cairo and Alexandria, and then you have the Nile Valley. And that's the Nile Valley is also um, a, a, an area that is now urbanizing, but in very different ways. And uh, we also have to look on what's going on in this, uh, in this place. So just as one example. And then um, we did still at the ETH Studio Basel um, quite, quite some uh, analysis about different places where we analyzed huge stripes of, um, of territories, um, usually hundreds of kilometers long and, and maybe 100 kilometers wide and, and um, in Florida and, and the Red River Delta and Muscat and Oman and other places um, to understand what does it mean um, extended urbanization. Then at the same time, Milica Topolovic and her team, they analyzed Singapore, but not Singapore, the, let's say the city, but Singapore, the extended urban region. Um, Neil Brenner uh, with his team also started to make this kind of analysis uh, about extreme territories of urbanization. And so here, for instance, he, um, he analyzed the Arctic. Um, so just to show you, there is now quite some, already quite some work done on these kind of processes. And in the, our last project, Territories of Extended Urbanization, um, we analyzed um, a whole range of different places. For instance, here, the biggest mine on earth in the midst of Amazonia, in the midst of the rainforest, um, with, all, with all sorts of consequences. Um, and that's the project, I just go on. And with this project, we already made um, an intervention in the Biennale in Venice. Um, and, uh, and, and, and this will soon be published now as a book. So, um, okay, so extended urbanization, it, it has certain challenges. Um, it has certain effects. So we often think that we have to understand cities uh, for a sustainable urban development. But from our point of view, we have especially to understand the peripheries. Um, extended urbanization poses important challenges for the climate crisis, for the biodiversity crisis, for the agrarian crisis that will soon haunt our, our planet. And so what we need is a kind of um, a new urban agenda that also addresses these kind of important questions. And um, here we somehow define three basic processes that we think are really important. Operationalization, enclosure, peripheralization. We will come, uh, Nitin will explain those processes just in a moment. And uh, so that's now our project in the context of the Future Cities Lab, global new agendas on the planetary organization, designing sustainable agri-urbanisms. Um, we have a great team 
there is not much time now to explain the team, but um, so of course it's Milica Topolovic, um, it's Naomi Hanakato in the in the as principal investigators uh, together with me, and um, we have a whole range of collaborators. And um, we have also um, so, some, some other great teams with uh, Adrian, Professor Adrian Great Regame, with Professor Christoph Küffer, uh, with Professor Johann Six, and their teams. And we will learn more about that in a minute. Um, I'm coming to the conclusion. We have um, two basic clusters. What are we analyzing? We are analyzing on the first hand. Um, or in the first cluster, agrarian questions on the planetary organizations at uh, four examples. We will just gather insight into these four examples. And then we will make a much more detailed analysis um, about the region of Zurich. So we came back to our home base and, uh, and, and we will now try to analyze in detail these processes of extended urbanization and this agrarian question um, uh, in, in a place that we know very well, because it's a new question. Uh, and, and so it's, it, it's quite good if you know the place well, where you try to uh, make sense and to develop further this question. Okay, thank you very much. And I hand over to Nitin Butler. Um, I, hope we, I hope you can share, uh, you can see my screen. Um, so just to follow up uh, on where Christian left, uh, so what we've been observing is that there's uh, increasingly uh, sort of um, um, a dissolution between the kind of journal uh, journal articles that come out in the journal Journal of Urban Studies or IDER and uh, Journal of Peasant Studies, and uh, there's there's sort of um, as sort of extended urbanization is happening in these agrarian territories. Um, there's, there's increasingly uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, agendas are sort of like mingling as, as, as Kanishka and Gunnivarden, I would say. Um, so we have, uh, we, we, we're sort of studying these three processes, as Christian was mentioning, of enclosure, operationalization, and peripheralization, which we sort of identified as dominant, um, comparative dominant uh, processes in three territories that we're studying. But we 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 don't. This is not to say that these are um, these territories are being constituted only through these processes, but rather that these are dominant processes, or this is something we are sort of investigating from from uh, uh, one of these cases. Um, we we are doing it uh, transductively, so uh, we don't take uh, the theory of extended organization there and try to read the case through it, but rather also populate. Uh, what we understand by extended organization through the reading of these territory from the ground. So, um, so in Delhi, uh, it's sort of a continuation of my PhD, which was at ETH Zurich uh, with Christian Schmidt, um, in which I was sort of looking at <clears throat> extended organization in this sort of, you know, uh, kind of uh, post, uh, post colonial uh, green revolution uh, territory um, around Delhi. So the hinterlands of Delhi, which are Sort of basmati rice and um, wheat agriculture, uh, and I'm look. I was looking at uh, sort of uh, the different processes, and I'm sort of investigating further in this sort of postdoctoral process uh, project uh, on um, the fragmentation of of uh, agrarian landscapes through enclosure, which is uh, not only directed through the imminent domain by the state, but is also increasingly uh, inflicted by sort of agrarian elites in these territories. Um, and sort of it's it's links to somehow like, you know, very, very material ways of urbanizing. So, you know, the, there are different uh, ways in which we can understand urban as well. Like in, in, in the territory that I study, it manifests in the form of real estate or in form of extraction in these sort of enclosed landscapes. But we also look for alternative, we search for alternatives, so uh, forms of commoning in, in, uh, and sort of undoing of, of fallows in some of these landscapes. And um, this is something um, I, I sort of identified in pastoral ontologies in the territory that I study, that how they try to undo these, these um, enclosures sometimes. Um, in Johor, uh, which is um, a case studied by uh, my colleague uh, Hans Hortik in, um, in, in, in Malaysia, 
He looks at sort of operationalization of agrarian landscapes um, through palm oil cultivation. And he's sort of uh, trying to study global supply chains, but also how it sort of manifests in this territory in the form of this the, these really huge, um, um, you know, great landscapes, which, um, which, which go through multiple layers and multiple cycles of operationalization. And he's, he's sort of already um, uh, going further in this research. He recently published this article um, on sort of like uh, 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 plant, uh, palm, palm oil plantations and uh, to, to villages in, in, these, in these landscapes. Um, the third case uh, is Arcadia, and it's kind of um, it's it's a European case, of course, very different, uh, but then very similar. It allows us sort of like a transversal reading of extended urbanization in agrarian landscapes, and it's about a peripheralization um, of of firstly uh, Greece itself, but uh, secondly also this sort of how Arcadia manifests as um, a peripheral landscape to um, the metropol metropolitanization of Athens, so to speak. So she's, um, Metexia is investigating also, you know, this sort of forest fires in, uh, uh, so she's sort of like making assemblages or like kind of um, making interesting links between forest fires um, of sort of like operationalization of these territories for windmills um, and uh, how, how do sort of, um, uh, EU subsidies somehow transform into uh, transform this highly productive um, olive olive uh, olive um, plantation landscape into something that is uh, post agrarian in a way or like kind of becomes um, greenwashed in a way. Um, so she's she's sort of investigating that and she's so, sort of also um, doing it at, it as a part of her PhD research, just like Hans. So I'll 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 end there and uh, perhaps uh, pass to uh, Naomi now. Sure, thank you, Nitin. Um, let me just make sure I share the right screen. Okay, hope you can all see my screen. Um, yeah, thank you very much um, also Nitin for kind of giving an overview of this um, first cluster that is looking at different types in which agricultural territories are undergoing transformation. Um, I want to look at a very specific kind of operationalization of agricultural landscapes, specifically um, the role of agroenergy businesses um, within these territories. Because interestingly, the production of renewable energies has been increasingly encroaching these territories. And agricultural landscapes um, are being operationalized by cultivating biofuel from corn, sugarcane, or palm oil, as we just heard, but also by applying in a way yet another layer of uh, infrastructures and exploiting the particularities of agricultural landscapes through large scale wind farms or, or solar plants, for example. And the impact on, lo um, on local livelihoods and ecosystems is actually often neglected in um, the dimension of um, talking about these renewable energies in terms of um, sustainability. And sustainability is often left out of the debates um, around and promotions for um, the renewable energy transition. But um, the production of renewable energy is, as you can guess, extremely complex and cannot be reduced to just the fact that it's drawing from um, replenishable sources. For various reasons, I just want to mention a few here. Um, not only do we need to take in a, into account um, the CO2 emissions throughout the entire process of cultivation and energy production of many of these um, renewable energy fuels or, or um, crops, um, 
but also take into account, for example, the, um, the CO2 emission that is generated through deforestation that precedes many of these, or that precedes these cultivation efforts. efforts. Um, and so this whole question of, is it really um, renewable and, and worth it in, in terms of CO2 emission has been questioned um, by recent studies and is at least not as obvious anymore. Um, but we also need to consider the impact of land changes um, through more lucrative renewable energy cultivation on, for example, subsistence farming. Um, and, and the fact that many of these land changes are challenging uh, food productions in local areas. Now, land grabbing um, is another example um, or is another uh, one of the other implications of these increasing um, renewable energy production um, sites. Um, land grabbing that are necessary to obtain lands for crop cultivation or the installation of um, the aforementioned windmills or solar plants. Um, and it's these kind of practices that are also leading to local disputes and challenging locally established land tenure systems. But of course, um, we should not forget about the impact of biodiversity or better to say the loss of biodiversity through the already mentioned necessary processes of um, deforestation leading also to soil degradation and the oftentimes um, connected exploitation of local water systems. I just want to show you here a few images of what these landscapes look, of what these landscapes look like. Um, here we have um, sugarcane landscape in, in Thailand. As you can see, massive solar plants, kind of this is the additional infrastructure layer that I was talking about. Um, similar to this one, a large wind farm um, in the north of Vietnam. Now, I want to very quickly look at one example more closely uh, within, Southeast, within Southeast Asia, but what we are focusing on um, here, more specifically Thailand. Um, where we can find um, a massive extension of um, sugarcane plantations, creating a, a increasingly uh, uneven socioeconomic um, landscape related in relation to sugarcane production. Um, the extraction of bioenergy is here introduced as an additional revenue source from sugarcane cultivation. So sugarcane cultivation continues and they found the way um, biofuel is generated is really in addition to the sugar production. But many farmers are in fact not aware of this um, additional revenue and um, uh, from the sugarcane um, residues, which is usually handled by um, locally centralized bioenergy producers. And therefore these farmers are also not included in the redistribution of the additional profits. At the same time, um, indebted farmers are many times compelled to sell their land to larger farming corporations, receiving a short-term gain, of course, but losing their only valuable asset, which is land, of course. Um, and with that, um, also the capacity to sustain themselves. And many of them are through these processes drawn in very vicious cycles of indebtedness. Um, to close, sorry, to close, um, this particular part of, of the new urban agenda project looks um, at the very specific kind of operationalization of agricultural landscapes, as I mentioned at the beginning, by looking really at the situatedness of renewable energy extraction, its drivers, including international funding schemes and its implications on the ground. And with this investigation, we kind of aim to explore the possibilities for a sustainable way of renewable energy extraction in agricultural landscapes, but of course also um, the aim of becoming aware of the various multiple challenges. So we look at energy production here, not as a technical issue, 
but really primarily as a spatial one. And at its multifaceted um, faceted relationships to sites of extraction, to geographic specificities, specificities of these landscapes uh, related to resource availabilities and cultural practices, of course. And all of these aspects being extremely interdependent um, on local and regional market demands, which we all need to consider in the design of sustainable agri-urbanism. And with that, I pass on to Caro. Thank you. Um, okay, I hope you can see my screen now. Um, yes. also, hello from my side. So I will introduce um, the, the design cluster of the pro project, um, the agroecological design cluster, the cluster two, which represents the research integration cluster here. And, and we are engaging here in um, design within the extended urbanization regions uh, in Zurich specifically, um, and the cluster is structured by three main groups, the VP2, 3, and 5. Um, as you have seen in this sketch, I will also name the participants in, in, in these VPs in a moment. And here the aim is to understand processes of extended urbanization in agriculture territories, linking land use change, ecosystem services, and soil ecology to urbanization, creating concrete design proposals for agroecological landscapes, and designing new policy instruments and governance arrangements for the Zurich region. So here we focus really on exploring the possibilities of our um, developed territorial approach into um, planning and offering new design readings for the region. I would um, like to try at least to briefly and, uh, explain what uh, the research entails. So the first VP led by Professor Dr. Ajeng Petregami and Matteo Riva deals with the analysis of urban transformation of land use patterns and ecosystem services. And as an update from this group, we can say that Matteo presented his PhD research plan, which really sets the framework for this work package. Um, as in the first part of the work, they will involve um, within the investigation of uh, trajectories of urbanization and land use change in the past 70 years in, in the canton of Zurich, so from the 1950s uh, to the present time. Uh, further, the project will then um, investigate the influence of land use change on selected agriculture related ecosystem services or synonymous NCPs, nat nature's contribution to people, analyzing provisions and demands over time. Uh, and in the next step, they will start the global mapping of ecosystem services using past and current earth observation data, socio-ecologic, uh, economic and statistical information, and biophysical indicators for the Zurich region. Then, of course, beyond just providing food, agriculture areas also offer a variety of others and other nature's contribution to people, such as biodiversity, water regulations, and other aesthetic values. And in this way, um, new land typologies can be developed and the influence of urban forms on sustainable land development will be explored. The next VP is led by Professor Dr. Christoph Küfer, Professor Dr. Johan Six and postdoctor researcher Kevin Vega. And it works or they work on identifying and implementing novel soil ecologies in hybrid socio-ecological or anthropogenic landscapes. Uh, in the project focuses, first of all, in forming an understanding of urbanized soils in the Anthropocene, which is a topic currently very much understudied. Uh, further, they develop a multi-criteria framework to assess soil qualities uh, across um, the Zurich region. The methodology here focuses on the analysis of remote sensing data, agricultural land use and pollution data. And I'm showing here an example of Kevin's soil data collection he is currently working on. So further, they will work on understanding soil qualities within the context of the pedological process and in the veins of Swiss pedologist Hans Yen. As soil development under natural conditions, seen here in this diagram in the green lines, is actually 
or led actually to a wide range of uh, different soil types and only with the start of cultivation and further the intensification of agriculture practices, soil degradation emerged. So in this red line here, uh, ultimately leading to a convergence and su as such a collapse of soil diversity into a very narrow range of types, uh, which leads us to the question of how can we now diversify agricultural soils once again, or can we even build better soils? And ans in answering these questions, um, this will ultimately unlock, so to say, the possibilities to directly link this research to our um, last part of the project, the agroecological design part, which is, so to say, a common effort of many streams led by Professor Christoph, uh, Christian Schmid, Professor Milisa Topalovic, and supported by Vesna Jovanovic, Moritz Djordjevic, and myself, um, new design govern governance uh, proposals. Uh, based on the principles of agroecology agro are developed here, questioning the current tendencies of land use intensification and homogenization. And here agroecological design concerns really the hybridization of landscape and land use, designing systems with, let's say, less impact on the environment, less energy, less land consumption and less emission. And of course, these, so to say, landscape-based approaches require backing or framework uh, of territorial strategies, which involve governance and land use design. Um, and what we call, of course, the territorial approach to design, which we further want to develop also in, in the Zurich region. And one example to give here, which is helping us very much in this process is um, a study we did in the Greater Geneva region from 2018 to 2021, which was a contribution to a brief calling for new imaginaries and ideas uh, for the Geneva, what they call the ecological transition until 2030. Real approach, we were able to identify seven territories of that could support this transition. Um, and Within these new landscapes, um, so to say, we could imagine many, many projects. These territories created so um, these envelopes for agendas concerning governance and policy making that support the ecological thinking and planning, but also created concrete design recommendations and projects like this project here uh, for the south of Geneva, where productive land performs. As a, so, so to say, metropolitan garden hosting public and social services in related structures. And as for the Zurich case, we are currently in the process of aligning the study sites, working closely with all the groups involved, um, integrating our first findings. And the first sketch of the cartographic synthesis I want to show here was developed um, a map of agroecological landscape types depicting the existing landscape in, in Zurich within, at the moment, 16 types. And so far, the design cluster had six transdisciplinary workshops in which we vividly discussed these findings. Um, as the process is mainly also driven by detecting differences, we can imagine as explained, it is an iterative pro process that will probably last until the end of this whole project. And in terms of methodology, I just want to mention here that we engage simultaneously with two methods in parallel, carving out these types. One is an indicator-based multi-criteria analysis using empirical and socio-cultural information, which, lead, which also leads to this cartographic synthesis. And um, the other one is field work and site studies. And here really the research and design studios at the chair of architecture of territory um, lay the crucial groundwork, giving us the opportunities to challenge and adjust the conceptual frame against the small design interventions. And as for now, we can say that two design studios here in Zurich were really successful. I can just say that the students developed super interesting uh, ideas for regenerative food systems. Uh, for example, the retention landscapes uh, revitalizing wetlands with forms of new hydro permaculture, or as you may have seen in the announcement of today's talk, a landscape of fair milk. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Thank you, um, Christian, Naomi, and um, uh, Nathan for such an interesting talk. Um, I think what jumps out at um, everyone, uh, at me immediately, is how uh, complex this whole undertaking is. And not only are you looking at planetary urbanization, which uh, by the term itself uh, suggests the complexity of the project, but you're looking at it from so many, uh, through so many different layers of information. Uh, from soil to uh, the renewable energy ex extraction to the social aspect and uh, land regulations. And so it, it's such an exciting project. And then the geographic complexities of Asia and Zurich and how they both uh, interact with each other. So that big diagram that you made where everything comes together to me is very exciting. Uh, it gives me a certain understanding of the project. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. I invite everyone to type in any questions in the chat box or just unmute yourself and uh, ask it yourself. Um, but for me, uh, I can just kick off with a, a very broad question to all of you. Uh, it, uh, when I, the image that Krishan showed in the beginning with the uh, flows in the, the urbanization, the sea, I found it very compelling. And, and the, all the flows that are connecting all of these urban regions and supporting urbanization that, that are sort of invisible to us. And then when you wrote this proposal, this was, uh, this was pre-pandemic a long time ago, and then all of this has happened in between. And there's been the, a, a serious disruption of flows in, and it's the concept of extended urbanization and disruption of flows. I was, do you have any reflections on this post, all that has happened since you wrote the proposal? Yeah, maybe I just I just uh, try to answer. Um, I, I mean, the interesting thing is um, that it became that that I think the world became more aware about the difficulties of these flows. Um, I, I mean, the, so I mentioned actually the crash of the of the of the of the huge um, container boat in in the in the Suez Canal. Um, and that had nothing to do with, with, with the pandemic, but it already showed how vulnerable this kind of um, system is. And then, and then, of course, came came all these difficulties. To at the beginning, we might still remember the problem with, for instance, with um, medicaments. Um, and it, it turned out that, uh, that there was a shortage of very very common medicaments uh, in, in in many places because. Um, of the disruption of these um, uh, of, of these production chains, and so so we see here that um, I, I mean just this world system of flows um, has many many um, I mean difficulties and um, can be easily interrupted, and I think what happens now is um, I think a, a strong awareness about this kind of um, connections. And to make them much more resilient, and that, of course, has as a consequence also that I think this extreme spatial division of labor that developed um, in the last twenty years will somehow, to a certain extent, be reversed. And I think that's a good thing. Even if I mean, especially if we look on the consequences of this extreme division of labor and of this extreme operationalization of so many landscapes and of so many. Um, uh, processes that we think yes we have to we have to we have to somehow regionalize that and I think the, the big regions of course but also the small region we have to regionalize that otherwise we are lost um, with, and, and we can never solve the problem of of, uh, of the of the of the CO two emissions we can't solve the diversity crisis we can't even solve the agri agricultural crisis um, that if if we if we don't find ways to somehow somehow go in into a different direction and i think exactly so so the, so the study of planetary urbanization and extended urbanization is exactly meant to give us um, tools um, intellectual tools and, and and conceptual tools to understand that better and 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 and, and drive us to a different pathway of urbanization um 
if there's no other question, I just had one more, one more for Carolina, because um, another compelling image for me, like I said, was all these work packages and how they're connecting. And there was this big circle with the design governance policy that you, the work package that you're part of. And uh, it seems fitting that it's design and it's kind of the connector, the glue for all of these other circles and kind of trying to put all of this together into uh, operable or uh, applicable vision or um, applicable insights for policymakers, planners. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, all of these layers that you mentioned about soil or energy extraction is not something that we uh, usually traditionally consider as a planner, designer, policymaker. It's left to an expert and then it moves, it comes to you. How does this, uh, this kind of framework that you're working on, how does this impact your work as a planner, designer? I would say that we are really lucky in that project that we have the experts at hand. I mean, they are part of the team as well. And that's really what this design cluster is all about. It is a direct integration and also a discussion of findings from research and with experts and then testing it really. As a, so design is a testing ground and then we can go back and redefining the, the framework. I think, uh, yeah, definitely as a planner, I feel very fortunate, I have to say. Yeah, I also, I see the, it's so exciting to see uh, you discussing soil and then showing the uh, results from the studio as well. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's also, I, I mean, it's, it's really a great learning experience. I think here we, um, I think it's, I, I think all of us, we are in, in an intense learning process and learning our, our different approaches, learning our different languages, and, and also learn to, 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 to see the different possibilities that these different approaches um, open up, but at the same time, then also work really hard to bring it together. Because this, the problem is very often that this, um, let's say the, the, the specialization of the disciplines is one of the big problems. Um, why we can't make more progress um, in the understanding um, of, of, of the main challenges and in proposing um, a kind of um, new, new ways out, out of this crisis. I, I think that's, a, that's a, key, a key moment. And that's the reason why the whole project became really complex also for us. Um, and, and again, I mean, to somehow contain that, we said, okay, so the, the full, let's say the full spectrum um, of, of, of the different disciplines we apply on Zurich because this is our this is our home turf, and so so there we know precisely where we are, and um, and then but then nevertheless to have this global reach we need of course other examples that we look in that we look at in more detail all all over the world so that that at the end it's it's not the idea to make proposals for Zurich but it's the idea to somehow develop prototypes. Um, for, for certain, um, let's say, measures and, and proposals um, that, um, that we develop in, in the case of Zurich, but that we hope they could inspire also similar, um, let's say, processes and similar proposals uh, in, in, in many different places in the world. I can imagine it also inspires. So if you look at the interaction the other way from the big circle to the smaller circle, uh, the, the PIs of the other work packages May also would also benefit from the design inputs from the other way. And I see some of them also here in the audience. Johan is here, Adrian is here. And I don't know uh, if, if you would like to speak to that in any way about your experience in interacting with the team and putting this work package together. Yeah, I mean, I can, uh, I can just uh, say a few words also about, about this because um, I mean, for, for me, it also has been very enriching, uh, you know, to have these interactions, uh, you know, in the group. I mean, we, it's like uh, Christian was saying, sometimes we, we don't fully understand <laughs> what, what we're saying. Um, but, uh, but, you know, that's a nice challenge uh, in, in my view. And, and like, for example, I mean, and I've said that to the group too, is, is I've never been involved in, in some design uh, project. I mean, we we don't think in 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 that perspective, you know, the, of of like designing just something, um, and and so this has has definitely. Uh, I mean, it has been a challenge, but it has been very interesting for me to to start thinking in in that direction 
Um, and as you know, I mean, I'm also involved with the, in the project with Stefan Cairns. And, you know, there we have had less uh, focus on the design, but even there, uh, you know, it's also looking like uh, we will be, I mean, there we actually have a demonstration project. And, and so for us, I mean, for me, that's even stretching it further to, to like really trying to bring it even into the, into the practice. Um, so I would say it's been enriching, but it, it indeed has not been simple all the time. But why, why would we, uh, you know, why? simple is also boring. So um, I'm liking it that it's complex. <laughs> Maybe I can add something here. I think uh, what's uh, really enriching is that it's not just only about the operationalization of the design, but it's just also how the problem is formulated from the designers and how it's formulated from the science perspective and the engineering perspective is very different. And, uh, and I think just already this, how a problem is defined and to try to get a common understanding of what a problem is. I think this is, uh, this is the interesting part of this project. And I think this is very, I agree. I think it's very enriching, but also um, hugely, hugely challenging. I think Melitza has a question. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's actually also a comment since we are, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's, let's say our large team is here and we, we also see this presentation as, as just uh, perhaps it's, uh, it's one um, additional step in this row of uh, workshops that we've done uh, now since more than a year in, in uh, uh, kind of bringing together the parts of the project. And I think that, uh, that uh, um, I mean, I, I perhaps this is also to, to discuss between us, but let's say the, the design, design thinking is uh, always future, future oriented, right? Whereas uh, I think uh, scientific thinking is often uh, uh, um, analytical and sort of de delivers a kind of a hypothesis regarding the present, right? So I think that this, uh, puts us all, you know, so sometimes designers, um, let's say they, they uh, uh, you know, offer, offer imaginaries that are, that are interesting, but they're not kind of uh, perhaps grounded in a, in a very solid analysis, right? So, so there, I think there is this, uh, you know, I, I see the, the kind of a great potential in in, uh, in linking these these different contributions in a way that that uh, 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 you know that I think we can perhaps offer um, um, a kind of a, a future future scenarios that are that are let's say based in a solid science which I, I think is not not uh, what designers are, are normally able to do right it, without uh, uh, this kind of, um, uh, let's say, inter interdisciplinary collaboration, and I think that uh, th that I think is also also perhaps the the kind of a, <laughs> you know challenging part. So let's say aligning aligning all the elements so that they that they work uh, that they work together um, in basically offering some some uh, some kind of a plausible and solid alternatives, which I which I think are are needed. I mean, if you look at the food system anywhere in the world, so. Um, if are there any more questions from the audience? Any, any last words from the speaker? If not, in that case, well, um, maybe, yeah. maybe I can yeah. make a last a last word. I mean, just to, to summarize <clears throat> what came in. I mean, I think, um, and I already thought that. I mean, that uh, the Future Cities Lab, <clears throat> Singapore and Zurich and global, this should be places of experimentation, and it should be um, it should, should always be a, to to do to do projects in that context should always be a challenge, and particularly for the researchers themselves. 
So I think this is exactly what should be, from my point of view, is the goal and should be the goal of of um, of these of these programs. And um, in that sense, I think it's a very typical um, FCL project here. So um, I think that's and that is also what what is what makes it different. If, if you have other projects, smaller projects that we, we with the classical applications, um, I, I think they 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 are very often just in in already well known territories. Now here we are somehow going towards uncharted territories, and I think that's exactly how it should be from my point of view. Which is why I think having this discussion for me is equally meaningful as the final publication that you put together later and um, the book and the exhibition, because how you go about doing something like this is also very important to learn from. So thank you for your time today and being so candid about how you've been working together and where you're going forward. So I'm looking forward to seeing how all of this comes together in the next time you present something. Thank Great. you, Nitin. Thank you, Christian. Thanks, uh, Thank you, thanks everyone for being. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, <laughs> <Tati>. involved. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>